Good morning. Climate, why does it matter? Well, this candidate for the poster child for the 2021 heat wave in the Pacific Northwest might say that it matters. I'm going to talk a little bit about that heat wave and the drought of 2021 because it is related to a short-term climate event. A little bit about the observed trends we're seeing in temperatures, precipitation, air pollution, and a little bit about what climate models are projecting for the future. All right, the heat wave of 2021. It was an extreme one. All kinds of records set across the Pacific Northwest, including in Washington State. These brown bands for Seattle at the top and Spokane at the bottom show the normal range of temperatures. The blue bars show what they were each day with, again, records set all over the place. Consistently warm nighttime temperatures and, at least in eastern Washington, sustained heat. Not going to go a lot into about the dynamics of, you know, what caused that, but it was an extreme weather event. And we've seen this set up before. It was just an extreme example of it. In terms of why climate matters, it definitely matters from a human health standpoint. And in particular, there was a tremendous toll associated with the heat wave of 2021. Depending how you count, hundreds versus upwards of more than a thousand fatalities due to that event. Uh, one thing that is uh, I find kind of remarkable also is just how long it remained hot, especially in terms of the nighttime temperatures. I'm going to follow up on this in a, in a few minutes here. But uh, here this map shows the nighttime temperatures, minimum temperatures relative to normal for that 30-day period from the end of June through much of July. And uh, those brick red colors in eastern Washington where it's more than 8 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than normal in terms of the nighttime temperatures, which is a huge signal from a short-term climate perspective. It was an all-time high temperature record set in Washington State this summer? Well, there was a committee formed to look into that, and the answer is in the affirmative. Uh, this map here just shows some temperatures at the late afternoon on the hottest day in eastern Washington, lots of 116, 117, 118. One place on the Hanford site, there's good evidence that it hit 120 all-time state record. At the same time, while this may not look as impressive, uh, there were actually some relatively high dew points, moisture contents in eastern Washington. Here in the irrigated sections of eastern Washington, getting into the 60s and so forth. And so with those kind of dew points coupled with the really high air temperatures, the heat stresses on people doing moderate amounts of activity outside, like agricultural workers, was such that they can work only about 15 minutes out of the hour without suffering a heat stroke. The heat wave is a big deal. There was a group, the World Weather Attribution Group, a bunch of esteemed climate scientists who put together a analysis of this past heat wave in the climate change context. And here uh, for SeaTac Airport, among other places, they looked at this uh, time series at the top shows the maximum temperatures each year going back to 1950 or so. And then here's 2021 well above all the rest. They point out, like heat waves elsewhere, that there's a link between the global temperatures as a whole and how hot it can get at a place. It's not a real tight relationship, but definitely there's a positive correspondence there. And all that means is that basically the global warming made that heat wave that much more likely to happen, and it made it that much more intense, something like 2 degrees C, almost 4 degrees Fahrenheit hotter than it otherwise would have been. And alarmingly, it means that with the continued warming that is basically baked into the system, pun intended, that these heat waves are going to come along not every year but in not too far in the future something like every five or ten years based on the analysis this group did. The heat wave was related to what was happening in terms of precipitation and in particular where these brick red colors are for the months of March through August 2021. That was the driest in a record extending back over a century. The dry so for that period in these places where it's kind of the orangish brown color is in the lowest 10%. Very dry landscape. So what difference does that make? 
Well, it turns out when you have a dry landscape and the vegetation is dried out, that means there's less evaporation, less transpiration from the vegetation. And so the sun's heating goes into heating the soil rather than evaporating as much water because there's no water to evaporate. It means that much hotter temperatures in a hotter and drier soil. There's quite a bit of work, recent research, that links, uh, especially in Europe, on uh, the major heat waves they've had in the last couple of decades have been preceded by drought conditions. Uh, the really warm and dry conditions really did a number on our stream flow in Washington State. This black trace going uh, back from October 2020 through January of this year shows how that stream flow was compared to the average and there's kind of bright green band in the middle. And on uh, the decent snowpack we had last winter melted pretty fast because the spring and summer was so warm and dry. And so stream flows went down really low by September relative to their usual for that time of year. And of course, we had some atmospheric rivers, especially in the northwest part of the state, that really gave some high stream flows in November. So uh, this kind of whipsaw maybe is a little bit of a dress rehearsal for what we're going to be seeing more of in the future. In terms of the temperatures that are actually measured across the Pacific Northwest, this particular plot shows some work from a paper published some years ago showing for the Top row, afternoon maximum temperatures, the bottom row, nighttime minimum temperatures for different seasons, winter, spring, March through May, summer, and fall, with the color of the dots showing the overall trend. Red dots mean warming trends, and um, there's a few blue ones, but the point I want to make here is that there's a lot more red dots than blue dots, of course, and that minimum temperatures are heating up a little faster than maximum temperatures in the actual observations. We can also see that in a different look where it just average the temperatures across the state here, focusing on the summer season, the maximum temperatures going back to the 1890s. Yeah, they go, you know, up and down, a lot of variability, upward trend, but a lot of year to year variability in those maximum temperatures for this Washington state as a whole. Compare that to the minimum temperatures, less variability, more of a trend. This is something that we're seeing have seen and are liable to see more of. One of the reasons for that is that it's, uh, the atmosphere is actually getting humid, more humid in terms of not relative humidity, but how much absolute water vapor there is in the air per cubic meter or however you want to kind of calculate it. We have good records here going back to about 1950. And uh, this more humid conditions makes sense that that's connected to our increase in minimum temperatures in the summer in that we know that deserts cool off a lot more at night versus wetter tropical regions like southeastern U.S. and so forth. What about winter? Here you're going to learn a lot more about weather patterns and fronts and that sort of thing. They are still a real dominant factor in determining our conditions in the winter and so you see a lot more variability winter uh, to winter going back over a hundred years. But again, there's a upward increase. Here it's, uh, I'm showing minimum temperatures. It's not too much different in this case than maximum temperatures. Uh, how does the climate relate to extreme events, short-term events? Here I've merely counted up the number of hot days, arbitrarily 90 and above, a Diablo Dam on the west side of the state name picked purposefully, and at Spokane on the eastern part of the state in red. And here it's a pretty noisy time series, maybe some tendency for upward trends there. But, you know, this is just one of those aspects of the climate system that is just barely emerging from the noise. In terms of the coldest temperature of the year, another way to look at, you know, these short-term weather events. At Olympia here, well away from the urban core of the Puget Sound region, maybe some tendency for um, less likely to have really cold day in the winter. Spokane, don't see much of a trend there except for maybe in recent years and that could be a fluke. So again, not everything is showing the same sort of trend. Definitely something that's not showing much of a trend is snowfall at Spokane. It is often cold enough to snow there and just that's a shotgun blast in terms of when you just look at how much has occurred each year back again uh, more than 100 years. What about precipitation? Water is life, right? So if you just look at the water year as a whole, 
and here I'm broad view for the Pacific Northwest, no real trend. There are kind of dry years and wet years and actually multi-year periods that are dry and wet, but no overall trend. One thing that is kind of at least disquieting and concerning is what we're seeing in terms of summer precipitation. And this is for Washington State as a whole. And the last few decades have seen a downward trend in precipitation there. Is this an early indication of is something that's going to be sustained with global climate change? Maybe. Can't say for sure. But certainly recent summers have tended to be on the dry side. Uh, we're seeing changes in our streams, and their one size does not fit all. In particular, there are streams that get both snow and winter, uh, snow and rain in the winter, and there are streams that are mostly low elevation that get predominantly rain, and then there are streams like the Okanagan in the eastern Washington, the Columbia is another example, which most of their watershed is dominated by snow. Where we're really seeing changes in there are these ones that these mixed type, they get both rain and snow. So some high flows in the wintertime, some higher flows in the springtime. And now with the warming temperatures, the disproportionate amount of that precipitation is falling as rain now versus in the past decades. And so we're seeing the biggest flood of each year is tending to be bigger than it used to be. Not at all on the snow dominant ones, and maybe it's just starting to emerge in the rain dominant type of watersheds. Remember the blob, the really warm waters that were off the Pacific Northwest coast? Well, if not, you know, more power to you, but it did have an impact on our weather. Uh, the prevailing winds in Washington State are from the west, off the ocean. It led to the warmest winter we've had on record, abysmal snowpacks. And it wasn't just the skiers that were out of luck, but our freshwater ecosystems. With the lack of snow in the mountains, there are the stream flows went lower than they, uh, faster than they usually do in the spring and summer. The lower stream flows meant warmer temperatures here. An example in the South Fork of the Nooksack, the blue is the actual temperatures January through summer. The gold triangle is the average and so very warm temperatures for salmon that are trying to get back to their spawning beds. This is a picture from a different river. It was a good run of salmon into the Columbia Basin system, but very few of them got past McNary Dam, not far up from Bonneville Dam, because the waters were so warm. Fires. Public records here are kind of hard to get a hold of going too far back, but just in the last couple of decades, we don't see really any trends in the number of fires. It's a short period to assign trends over, but a tendency for more acres burned with a consequence, of course, for air quality, especially on the east side of the state. This may be um, part and parcel due to, uh, at least in part, to the drier conditions we've had. And when the winds come up, then that much more of the landscape can burn. All right. I could show you more graphs about why we think there's global warming, but perhaps this little cartoon or photo, you know, says it well enough. What I am going to show is just a little bit of from what the climate models are indicating. And this is for the kind of business as usual, the track we're on right now in terms of greenhouse gas concentrations and fossil fuel combustion. And what this is showing is an ensemble of climate models, what they're showing as a whole in terms of the warm up here in the upper left in winter versus the warm up in summer, with especially inland from the Cascades, um, very marked changes by the 2040s through 2060s relative to the end of the 20th century. You know, the all important water. Part of that and precipitation in particular, the models as a group have a consensus. It's not unanimous, but a consensus. Wetter winters and drier summers with the increase in wintertime being greater than the decrease in summertime. But still, more water when we don't need it as much and less when we really need it. And that is reflected here in these series of plots, different time periods, where the winter runoff and summer runoff. This is for the Puget Sound Basin as a whole. Forgive me for being parochial. I just like the portrayal here, but the, the idea is that especially as we get further into the century, many of our watersheds are going to get a lot more, substantially more runoff in the wintertime, but less in the summertime.
heat waves back to the, those guys as the temperature is warm the distribution of temperature anomalies you know the, most days are close to normal temperatures there's a few here the tails of the distribution that are really cold or really hot as that distribution shifts with warming there's going to be more hot days that reach this threshold in which there are impacts on the natural and human systems uh, even more probably in marine heat waves more about that is a different talk and I'd just like to conclude here with a little bit about what is climate matter human health impacts and maybe a part that is not appreciated as much as it should be and that is not just how warmer climate can impact heat waves but uh, things like diseases and uh, in particular an example here is vector and rodent borne diseases an example is West Nile virus. We already have West Nile virus occurrence in the state. People are infected each year. There has been a fatality. About 20 a year die in California from it. With time, the conditions that are favorable for the mosquito that carries this virus are going to be more prevalent in the Pacific Northwest, and we're going to have probably more West Nile virus with some really human health consequences. And it's not just human health that is a potential problem, but uh, for agriculture. There's various pests that now are a problem, but not maybe a crisis. An example there, I would think, is this uh, little guy, the potato psyllid, picture in the upper left, that right now it overwinters to the south of Washington State and tends to move in in the, the spring and summer. It carries a bacteria with it that is the real problem for the potatoes. Conceivably, as the climate continues to warm, it's going to get a toehold in the state or at least be closer and there's going to be more infestations of this bug. And there's other examples like that. Mildew is another one. Are conditions still going to be favorable for wine grapes? I'm talking about maximum uh, minimum temperatures in the summer going up turns out to have high quality wine grapes you need the cool nights so they can develop the acids there are no great cabernets that come out of mississippi let's say and so these changes that have occurred and are occurring we ignore them at our own peril just to sum up here the heat wave of 2021 was in some ways a real wake-up call to be sure, a rare event, it's not like we're going to have one every year or so forth, but there's very solid evidence. It was basically made possible by climate change, that the severity of it, and that alarmingly, that in not too long, with continued warming, a heat wave of that intensity will come along every five, ten years or so. In the actual observations, we're seeing the winters tend to be not as severe, but what I'm really concerned about is what is happening in summer. These minimum temperatures going up with the summers recently being drier and the model is suggesting that's going to continue, that that, is, that could be a big deal. Speaking of precipitation, this past winter when we had these um, extreme atmospheric rivers hitting the northwest part of Washington state, chances are we're going to have more intense of those examples of heavy precipitation events. Not necessarily more frequent, but just when they happen, when everything comes together, there'll be that much more rain from them. I didn't really have a chance to talk about this. We don't see really any trends in the observed windstorms. This is still kind of an open question how storm tracks may change. And right now, I would say, not necessarily getting to get more storminess, but maybe the very most intense storms could be more intense in the future. And finally, again, I didn't talk about air pollution in winter. And in many parts of the state, it's actually getting better because the warmer temperatures, people are phasing out their really old and dirty wood stoves. But on the other hand, the tendency is for smokier air in the summer with more fires, especially on the west side of the state. I appreciate the chance to kick off this uh, weather school, and I encourage you, if you have some climate questions or, you know, whether it's data or interpretation, that sort of thing, contact us at the Office of the Washington State Climatologist. And I trust these slides will be shared with all the participants here. And again, uh, thanks for your attention.